China IP licensing deals. This is from China Law Blog. And this was written September 14th, 2020. We're going to scroll on down to the area that I've uh, highlighted here. And that is, uh, well, let's just hear, uh, I like this right, <clears throat> right here. I'm not sure we're going to go through all this, but just, you'll see where I'm going with this. The, the, the essential news here, which I'll just show you real quickly, is going to be about this China Supreme People's Court releases provisions on several issues concerning the application of law in the trial of administrative cases <coughs> concerning patent, grant, and confirmation. But we're not going to get to that because I want to kind of set up a bit of backdrop. This is going to be, by the way, folks, a definitely maybe maybe a half hour-ish video. Every once in a while I'm going to do one of these. This is a more in-depth story. I might reserve, th reserve this. Maybe this is what I'll do on Sundays. Maybe a long, long-form video. So what we've got here from China Law Blog, <coughs> licensing agreements are usually more complicated than manufacturing agreements, but less complicated than joint venture agreements. Okay. The email, okay, so the e this email was in response to the potential client having requested we help them with the things we should be doing to prepare our upcoming meeting with our potential <coughs> licensee. And this is folks that are doing business in China. And the email list was as follows. One, make sure all of the IP, trademark, patent, copyrights <coughs> your licenses may use is registered in China. You do not want a situation where your potential China licensee files for your trademark so as to gain negotiating leverage against you. If such IP is not already registered, get it registered. Our China IP lawyers can help you with this. <coughs> so... Make sure your potential license is legitimate. Are you going to allow this potential licensee to sublicense? What sort of controls are you going to want over this licensee's use of your technology and your name? Who is going to pay what in terms of marketing your technology and your name in China? I'm guessing it is going to be the Chinese company, but you should get clear on this. Who is going to be responsible for paying Chinese taxes on the royalties? For a whole host of reasons, you're going to want this burden to fall on your China licensee interesting china there we go that's just to get to try to do this and these stories give you a little bit of a visual context of what we're talking about there china 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 that's a song let's get to this <clears throat> this is relevant i know it might not seem like it right now but it is this is a part of the war prayer here. We're not going to read this whole thing. We're just going to read this this part right down here. This is the essential part here. Help us to drown the thunder of the guns with the shrieks of their wounded. Writhing in pain, help us to lay waste their humble homes with a hurricane of fire. Help us to wring the hearts of their unoffending widows with unavailing grief. Help us to turn them out, ruthless with their little children, to wander unfriended in the waste of their desolated lands and rags and hunger and thirst. Sports of the sun's flames in summer and the icy winds of winter, broken in spirit, worn with travail, imploring thee for the refuge of the grave and denied it. For our sakes who adore thee, Lord, blast their hopes, blight their lives, protect their bitter pilgrimage, make heavy their steps, water their way with their tears, stain the white snow with the blood of their wounded feet. Wow. It's not really meant to be a kind of prayer that you're going to want to pray, by the way. If you don't know the context of the war prayer, it ends here, it says, after a pause, ye have prayed it. If you still desire it, speak. The messenger of the Most High waits. He's basically uh, making it raw. The uh, con, the, the consequence of the assumptions that these people are making that are allowing them to subhumanize others so that they can countenance such things happening to them. 
These people are gathering to pray for their people to win in victory, and this is what he's saying you're really praying for. So I think that's something to keep in context when we're talking about China right now, because the ability for demagogues on the left and or right or any other weird whatevers, it really doesn't depend on anything. Uh, the ability to use China as a, a scapegoat that goes far beyond uh, looking at what the, the, the administration of China is enacting and doing and the context also of what China does in relation to other nation states. And when you look at what China does even right now in relation to other nation states, I'm just going to tell you, they're no more or less human than any other nation state that would find themselves in their circumstance. They are operating within the bounds of nation statism with a with a with a with the vehicles of power that they have available within their nation state and the vehicles of power that they face from without. So I want to keep that context. It's very important as we go forward. <clears throat> At least to me it is, subjectively. So this is from Lexology. Uh, this is uh, China's IP antitrust guidelines released to the public. This is August 26, 2020 is when this is. The highlighting the key part here that I thought was important. The IP guidelines clearly provides that although an IP right by its nature is an exclusive right, quote, an undertaking shall not be presumed to possess a market dominance in the relevant market merely for holding an IP right, unquote. Interesting. Interesting little uh, loophole there. <laughs> Dynamic. I, well, abusing IP rights itself. I'm, I'm always trying to get ahead of where I'm at in the story and I have to slap my hand and say, no, no, just stick with the story. We'll get to it. Abusing IP rights itself does not constitute a, quote, monopoly behavior, unquote. Regulating abuses of IP rights should follow the same regulating methodologies as those of other forms of property rights within the basic legal analysis framework under the PRC anti-monopoly law, namely the characteristics and manifestations of the conduct. Two. Definition of relevant markets. Three, the elimination and restriction effects of such conduct on market competition. And four, the pro-competitive effects of such conduct on innovation and efficiency. In addition, when determining whether an IP right constitutes a monopolistic monopoly behavior, these two factors should be taken into account. Quote, the specific features of the IP rights, unquotes, for example, the IP rights are vulnerable to being infringed upon in practice, etc. And quote, the pro-competitive effects of relevant conduct on the efficiency and innovation, unquote. So now my purpose of this article isn't necessarily to try to get into the philosophical existential underpinnings and <clears throat> whatnots of the type of uh, logic that this Chinese court has defined to give other courts some framework, some guidances to apply IP law. My point is going to be more, well, it's going to be more about the 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 sticky wicket that China finds itself when dealing with itself in one sense still as an emerging power and in one sense as an established power. An established power would be highly incentivized to develop IP constraints, not fundamentally so that other nation states don't define it for them. Whether or not they agree with IP in principle or not, they would rather have it define themselves from within and apply that to other nation states doing business from within than to have those nation states define it for them. So this is this is what they're in the business of. Uh, at, the, at its heart, they almost have to do this. But at the same hand, IP is... 
well, it's, it's a colonizing tool that uh, protects those that have and it prevents emerging competition. So I could see in this ruling even, quote unquote ruling or definition, whatever you want to call it, I could see the, the effort by the Chinese to try to walk between the reality of power in their own land and the reality of power outside of their own land in terms of the vehicles of power, the, the ideas, concepts, uh, wh whatever your various uh, abstract concepts are that uh, govern action in your uh, communities, civilization, societies, whatever, that the Chinese have a, I guess you can say they have a healthy respect for copying as a cult, especially over the last two, three hundred some odd years, as a as a culture that finds itself fundamentally on the on the wrong end of IP, they could find all kinds of reason to to enhance any type of ideational construct they got already within that encourages such type of uh, IP rebellion, because. China, if it were to ever have emerged as a power and played straight in terms of IP, would never be where it is today. And who can blame them? Who can blame them for what they've done? <clears throat> I don't. I don't find fault in what they're doing fundamentally as an Asian state. And then, but there's a price to be paid for that. And the price is if you find yourself in any position of weakness where you're dependent on these uh, entities that you've been, you have been for a long time, the the underdog. And people kind of look the other way for a variety of reasons. It's not noble reasons, it's self-interest, it's there's money being made, but still, one of the reasons that they were willing to sacrifice security and give it to China was maybe fundamentally they just never believed that you would be much of a threat anyway and who knows but uh, at any rate the deal was made and no fault for China in taking the deal the fault is almost entirely with those that took the deal in the own in, in the disinterest of their own nation state and the people that took those deals by the way all types of nation states all types of uh, individuals that represent families with traditional ties to multiple political factions this is a cross the board uh, issue uh, across all societies and uh, china has only been doing what any nation state would do if they needed to do this to you know, secure themselves as fast as they can china's supreme court Supreme People's Court releases provisions on several issues concerning the application of law and the trial of administrative cases concerning patent grant and confirmation. China's Supreme People's Court published on September 11, 2020, effective September 12, the provisions on several issues concerning the application of law and the trial in the trial of administrative cases concerning patent grant and confirmation. The provision clarify the provisions clarify administrative litigation issues for patent re-examination board decisions, both invalidations of granted patents and re-examination of finally rejected patent applications, similar to patent application appeals at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Claim Interpretation, Article 2. Articles, articles 2 through 4 cover claims interpretation stating that the people's court shall define the term of the claim based quote on the usual meanings understood by those skilled in the technical field after reading the claims descriptions and drawings if the terms of the claims are clearly defined or illustrated in the specifications and drawings the definition shall be followed if the terms cannot be defined in accordance with the provisions of the preceding paragraph the terms may be defined in conjunction with technical dictionaries, technical manuals, reference books, textbooks, national or industry technical standards, etc., commonly used by technicians in the technical field. Further, the People's Court may refer to relevant statements of the patent 
T that has been adopted by the effective judgment of the civil case of patent infringement when defining the terms of the claims in the administrative case of patent right corporation. It's amazing how when uh, desperate uh, limitations of language, how the bureaucracy or the bureaucratization of uh, language is almost universal. I remember the Chinese did it far before anybody else they did it a couple thousand years or so before everybody else did by the end of the of the bc era of humanity i i i grew up here it was bc we, it was before christ i see why they turned it to bc when you live in a pluralistic land probably a good choice before common era i still think of for me personally it's still bc but bce so by zero BCE or, or zero uh, CE, common era, the Chinese had gone through iterations of bureaucratic explorations and justifications uh, at, at complex levels for hundreds of years before that time. So if you see this language, this isn't them reflecting America. This is America reflecting them. <laughs> it's any but and not really them but because they didn't really get it from the chinese but for various reasons whenever you develop these type of uh the more you micromanage the affairs of others the more finite you have to uh work the language on paper to try to describe what it is that you're justifying doing to other human beings and uh, China has, has a rule of law concept, which is born from the edicts of a king. But once the king's edicts are, are issued, then China must utter for it's the, well, vaguely the, the, the Confucian model, which is uh, that uh, it is the, the ethics of government. And the righteousness of government is in applying the law justly the law itself is not judged by justice the law the fruit of the justice of the law is in the fruit of the living in terms of the the leader the people the land all of it the, the mandate of heaven kind of fruit kind of a demonstration so it's it's not rule of law as in we follow the precedent of law we follow the precedent of law within the framework of the individual who defines law by that individual's own working the leader is the ethics and the leader reflects the ethics this is why chairman z is uh working on all his uh uh, uh z sayings z z z z z i don't know if they're just called z sayings or whatever they're called it's because he is he is doing that role he is he is he fills out the ethics he defines the ethics and then it's for the bureaucrats to work out the finite language that allows them to apply his ethics so like the next one comes along if he realistically or she uh they're they're capable of having a female leader uh if a uh, if he or she comes along they can change completely if if the reality of power really allows it if they have the if they have the people that will kill people that need to be killed to assure that this thing goes through they can redefine then the morality the ethics without having to rely on the precedent of the past in and of itself and then the rule of law is then emerges from that so this is the context of uh, how these courts operate but they still must do what all courts do that uh, even uh, in any way shape or form try to establish some sort of uh, quote unquote, neutral standards expect expect uh, predictable standards that people can operate within so especially in this area, like I said earlier, China is in a, an understandable effort to define its own understanding of IP before it keeps allowing foreigners to do it. And it's got this uh, 
precarious position in that it has been a consistent violator of IP. We'll get to that, but uh, it's been a consistent violator of IP because from a nation state standing, standing it, it absolutely needed to. It, we, we couldn't afford to just wait around for the long process of the, of the costly licensing process of getting access to any IP in any kind of uh, rapid manner. But now that it has to define IP, now it just now it's going to find itself as it begins to impose IP restrictions on foreign governments. They're going to start. They're going to they're going to do what governments do, whatever advantage of power they have. They're going to reach back in time. So I thought I thought this was a little bit of an interesting thing. This is China brand IP consulting Jimby. So let's let's check this out. Our main business is the red service line here, enforcement of uh, law, intellectual property, litigation, oppositions of uh, bad faith, trademark, customs actions, and so on. And finally, we work in the field of IP strategy related to China and Asia. What's the general situation now? Everybody knows that uh, the decoupling is in full swing. So that means that the United States are in the beginning of a technological war. So this war will uh, continue and accelerate. China, the Chinese response is the so-called dual circulation. The Chinese is strengthening the domestic circulation, the domestic market. They empower the Chinese firms in China and support their brands in mainland China. They plan to replace foreign companies based on the strategy made in China 2025. And this results in a reinforcement of the Chinese IP regime. The Chinese IP system has strongly improved in the last, well, let me say, two years or so. It's an excellent system comparable to the European or United States system. In some parts, is it more advanced? <laughs> There you go. I, I'll just let that speak for itself. I'll let you process that, see what you, uh, what you uh, come to believe. Now, now we're switching into the other side of this. This is the, this is the dialectical nature of uh, China's dilemma, if you will. And I'm really reaching as far as using the word dialectical, but whatever. They must, on one hand, define IP while at the same time now come up with a, a way to justify the. Uh, the continued uh, serial abuse of IP and their continued uh, they see they still must rely on stolen IP to can they they're not quite ready I'll say in their time frame they would have had maybe two or three more years at least more time to not need to steal IP they still need to steal IP now they'll it'll slow them down by maybe five to ten years as far as fully catching up with a lot of uh, the most advanced aspects of the world around them and and here's the thing that, that the biggest part is this what china fundamentally lacks is not advanced brains what china fundamentally lacks is is a deep a deep workbench they just lack, they have a very shallow workbench. That's their fundamental problem. And their workbench lacks, they don't lack the intellectual capacity. They lack the aggregate, uh, even historic aggregate knowledge that a lot of other nation states that they're competing with uh, have. And with the United States being by far and away, the nation state that has absolutely the deepest 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 workbenches they're the ones that are able to uh pluck from the world the bestest and the brightest and convert them to true blue believing united states citizens that build families that stay true blue believing united states citizens it's like they convert at least they have up to this point that's 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 the real power of america by the way so <laughs> i mean that's as i see it subjectively i'm you guys might have very good reasons to disagree, but uh, that is the way I see it. So this is from darkreading.com. Now I don't know anything about darkreading.com. I don't know their bio. I don't know their anything. I think I recognize maybe the read. I could be reading. I think Eric Noonan is a kind of a conservative person. I don't know. I have no idea. Oh, you know what? I'm just gonna say I have no idea. Let's just leave it at that. In 2018, oh, well, the headline is Time for CEOs to Stop Enabling China's Blatant IP Theft. In 2018, the U.S. Trade Representative found that Chinese theft of American intellectual property IP cost between $225 billion and $600 billion annually. Hard number to put a price on, but also 
a lot of these companies that were letting China get away with this stuff were making I don't know how much more money in return I have no idea but uh, who knows probably more and I don't know the are, are they just uh, saying that just in 2018 alone that's incredible if that's true that's 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 just astronomical that's like bigger than a lot of nation states whole yearly budgets the FBI is investigating 1,000 cases of Chinese IP theft. The push for profit at all costs has resulted in lawsuits, damaged competitiveness, and if a company competes for federal government contracts, as Google and Amazon do, it can also be a matter of national security. And get another story here. We have... Uh, this is the Department of Justice's National Security Division chief addresses China's campaign to steal U.S. intellectual property. Now, what I find the most interesting is this thing down here that it points out. China's thousand. So these are Mr. Deemer's reinforced that China is predominantly responsible for the theft of U.S. intellectual property and that the insider threat is a growing problem. China's Thousand Talents program serves as a vehicle for acquiring American IP. The individuals applying for the program, Mr. Denmer stated, must demonstrate that they will bring IP to China. Some take U.S. IP to China and get paid for work performed in China. Others simply hand over the IP to Chinese authorities. Thousand, China's Thousand Talents program. Thousand Talents program. Thousand Talents plan or Thousand Talents Program was established in 2008 by the central government of China to recognize and recruit leading international experts in scientific research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Both the United States and Canada have warned that China intends to use scientists who are involved with this plan to gain access to new technology for economic and military advantage. 1,000 Talent Plan Professorship is the highest academic honor awarded by the State Council, analogous to the top-level award given by the Ministry of Education. The program includes two mechanisms, resources for permanent recruitment into Chinese academia and resources for short-term appointments that typically target international experts who have full-time employment at a leading international university or research laboratory. The program has three categories. Innovative 1,000 Talents Plan, long-term, short-term. Let me, let me try to... There we go. Let's go. Innovative 1,000 Talents Plan, long-term, short-term, for Chinese scholars below 55 years of age. Oh, you bastards. Ageist. I'm 52, so I'm triggered. Foreign 1,000 Talents Plan, long-term, short-term, for foreigners only below 55 years. Mother, I'll punch you in the face. I'll punch you in the face. All right. This la well, I understand what this says, young scholar. Okay, I get this one. This one's fine. Well, actually, this is probably not fine for. Uh, I mean, it's 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 not at least it's not ageist. Young scholar, one thousand talents plan or overseas young talents project of Ta China for those below forty years of age. The program has been praised for recruiting top international talent to China, but also criticized for being ineffective at retaining the talent I get to our last little uh, highlight here this is from the uh, senate.gov uh, this is the 2019 report issue 2019 1118 PSI staff report China's talent recruitment plans this is this is items let's see finding of fact and recommendation findings of fact so these are number eight numbers eight and nine as far as findings of fact so number eight federal agencies are not prepared to prevent china from transferring talent taxpayer funded research and stealing intellectual property the u.s government was slow to address the threat of china's talent recruitment plans leading the U to U.S. government grant dollars and private sector technologies being repurposed to support China's economic and military goals. See, this is huge, huge, huge charge here. Leading to U.S. government grant dollars and private sector technologies being repurposed to support China's economic and military goals. So that military, that little warfare thing, 
this works for you Chinese people as well. I want you to think about that as well, because in terms of nation statism, it is absolutely not at all in the best interest of the United States of America for China to continue to be able to have the capacity to quote unquote steal IP. Now, I don't know if uh, any of you watched any of my videos for the past, you probably have figured out that my view of IP is less than flattering. And I'm not going to get into that for this episode or this, uh, this video. But uh, I do understand pragmatically, though, absolutely why the United States would be suddenly very, very, very self-righteous about IP and be trying to use whatever I advantage they can to try to hammer China and deal with China as what it is. It's a ruthless competitor for, uh, in the case of IP, artificially created finite resources that uh, have only a few winners and a whole lot of losers. And China and the United States are both right in what they're doing in, in terms of uh, their own nation state interests. They're absolutely the United States is right in trying to bludgeoning China with this self-righteous IP crap, and China is uh, all the more uh, right in trying to duplicitously uh, continue to rip off the United States and every other nation state, but the price it pays is uh, the, well, the more it gets caught, everybody cheats, everybody lies, everybody steals, everybody kills, all that. The pr problem is the more openly you do it. You don't do it openly. And China has decided in a lot of ways to start doing things openly. And that's why it's really losing losing ground here in a lot of ways. And just given all of these uh, foreign interests, all the ammunition that they need, if these interests could ever be con convinced, and I don't think it's possible, but if they say theoretically they could be convinced that they could somehow have access to the ease of profit that they once potentially had by cooperating with China they would leave China and knife them always up and down that they possibly could so China is probably wise in doing a lot of the things that it's doing as far as trying to develop programs for instance that create internal standards for Chinese IP and for Chinese brand development Chinese technological IP development. What's going to be very interesting is as, 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 as nation states rely upon international IP so much for them to be able to uh, do that, that, that sweet, sweet sugar media business, whether it's uh, video games or movies or news, whatever it is, if they're going to be able to do that sweet, sweet media business where all that fatty, fatty dollar is, I mean, that's where the real easy money is. That's a huge profits there. Uh, if they can do that kind of stuff, man, if they can manage that international standard, they need, they need players that can fundamentally trust one another. And when you have situations in which you don't have uh, a wide, uh, peaceful arrangement between nation, most nation states fundamentally, I'm going to be very interested to see just how much nation states that belong to this or that coalition are willing to honor the IP of corporations, especially corporations that have multiple nation state interests to the point where they have none. And they're kind of a nation state in and of themselves. That whole dynamic as it gets played out is going to be, well, it's going to be fascinating to watch. And I think with that, I thought this would have been about 30 minutes and it's uh, 33 minutes and that's fine by me. So I think I'll end it there. I thank you for joining me and I don't know, keep watching, keep watching this, keep watching China try to uh, deal with its uh, its dualistic, uh, here that might be better than dialect, dualistic nature, its, uh, it's uh, internal traditional power that relies upon IP to cut off new competition, and its external, it's, it's kind of in a tweener state now, it's still... It's partially entering into a traditional equal corporate uh, power on in the land in, in these markets. And at the same hand, it's still not quite there in a lot of other ways. So it still has to steal some IPs at a time when everyone else is like, okay, now you're a serious competitor. All right. 
All right, it's time for us to stop. Uh, it's time for us to start being self-righteous and self-serving, and use the uh, the uh, the uh, the precedent of IP to hammer your uh, potential rise in our markets anymore. It's kind of what. Well, good luck, China. Good luck, everybody else too. Good luck, uh, all those that continue to cling to IP. If anybody could ever magically blow the whole thing up, the IP is just the whole, if like suddenly you could erase the whole concept from all of humanity. Let me know, I'll press that button right away. Not everybody.